Well, hey there, Wallace Church. Pastor Cohen here, excited to be back with you for another week of storytelling. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's August now, end of August, early September. Election and campaign things are kicking off. And so I want to talk a little bit about citizenship today. You know, citizenship matters a lot, right? If you want to travel around, your passport dictates your citizenship. And that grants you access or limits your access to do or experience certain things. Well, <clears throat> in your citizenship, you may be like me. There are days where I'm very grateful, honored, and privileged to be um, an American citizen. And there are days where I feel like that is a good thing. And then there are other days where I'm just absolutely disgusted that we are spoiled American citizens. And so lots of times I don't feel 100% confident in my citizenship. And I think that can also be exacerbated in our citizenship within the church. You know, Paul famously says in Philippians 3 that our citizenship is in heaven. It's not here. And so our identity is more closer tied to our spiritual realm than it is our physical realm. And so by nature, if you think about your citizenship being in heaven and your spiritual realm... We see spiritual people do some very heinous things. And so how do we deal with citizenship? What happens in light of citizenship? This is the story of Paul and how his citizenship is interacting in twofold, the political realm and in the spiritual realm within the church. So last time, Paul had just gotten into Jerusalem, and there was that prophecy that he would be bound and worse would happen to him in Jerusalem. And Paul says, I'm not worried. I would die for the name of the message of the Lord Jesus. Well, then, beginning at the end of 21, we see Paul get arrested. And when he gets arrested, they seize him. They begin to beat him. It's, uh, it's a whole ordeal. Um, the text even says in 31 that they're trying to kill him and they're interrupted. And so Paul gets an opportunity to speak. He's, now he's in the temple, so he's, all of this is happening according to the temple police um, and the temple guards. And so these are the religious folk. And so eventually he gets brought to the tribune and what happens is he begins to give them a little bit of information about himself. Um, and he asks them, can I ask you something? And as he asks them, they notice that he can speak Greek. That shocks them. And he says, yeah, I'm a Jew born in the city of Tarsus. You know, I've educated here in this city under the feet of Gamaliel. I'm a citizen of an important city. That's what he says. But he does not tell them what city he's a citizen of. Roman citizenship is hands down the hardest thing to get in the ancient world. Um, you can tune in tomorrow to our episode of A Closer Look to find more out about Roman citizenship. But Paul is reserving it because it is so sacred to see how he's treated. And so he begins, uh, he says all of this and then the soldiers give him permission to speak to the Jews, to speak to his church, his people. And as he begins to speak, he speaks to them in Hebrew. Now, this is the first voice that he's given to them because they think he's some criminal. And so this is the first voice he's given. And he begins to tell them who he is and that he's a zealot and that he used to persecute people of the way, and that he's known by the elders, and he's telling them all this in Hebrew. And then he tells them of his conversion, and how he's sent to the Gentiles, and all the things he's been a part of. Well, at this point, they've listened, and then they get upset, so they send him to the Roman, Roman tribune. 
This is where things get interesting because when they send him to the Roman tribune, Paul lets them bind him up all the way up to the point where they're going to flog him. Because what they're looking for is information. And Paul's just kind of been gradually giving them information as we go along by the ways in which he's using different languages to reveal certain details and confirm other parts of his story. But up to this point, he's only said, I'm a citizen of an important city. And so now the church has turned him over to the Roman tribune. And they've bound him up because they're going to flog him. And they're going to flog him for information. And this is what the text says. Verse 25, But when they had tied him up with the thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who is uncondemned? Uh, he knows the answer to that. The answer is, absolutely not. You cannot flog a Roman citizen who is uncondemned. And so he goes back to the tribune and says, What are you about to do? This guy's a Roman citizen. So then they immediately change situations. And they begin to, he begins to speak to the tribune, and one of them says, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. And Paul says, yeah, but I was born a Roman citizen. So now he's got this legacy element connected to him. You see, what I want you to realize is right away, the Roman citizens have treated their citizen better than the church treated Paul better than the church treated this issue. And so because they are at a loss, they need information, they send him back before the council of, the, of Jerusalem, to the, back to the church, because they want to know what he's being accused of. And so Paul begins to speak. And this is what the text says. As they begin to have this conversation, verse 2 picks up. Then the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near him to strike him on the mouth. At this, Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting there to judge me according to the law? And yet in violation of the law, you order me to be struck. I want you to see that the way in which these two powers are being set up side by side, that Paul's leveraging his citizenship in both arenas. And unfortunately, it's not the church that's doing it appropriately. They're the ones that's corrupt. They're the ones that's bending rules. They're the ones that's exerting um, their extra power. And so Paul has to get very crafty in this moment. And Paul looks around the council. Remember, Philippians 3 tells us that Paul is a Pharisee. Acts 2 told us that he was a church leader. Or Acts 8 told us that he was a church leader when he persecuted Stephen. Paul looks around the room and notices that you've got Sadducees and Pharisees in this council. He knows that they got theological beef between them. Sadducees are not spiritual. They don't believe in resurrections or anything like that. Pharisees did believe in a general resurrection. You can tune into tomorrow's episode of A Closer Look to find out more about this divide as well. And so Paul looks around and Paul says and starts this theological conversation about the resurrection and angels. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees begin to fight amongst one another. Because remember, this is corruption. This is, this is a broken system over here. And as they begin to fight, the Pharisees say, I find no fault in this man. And the Sadducees continue to want to exert their power and have something happen to him. And so this is what it ends up being. Picking up in verse 10. When the dissension became violent, the tribune, fearing that they would tear Paul to pieces, ordered the soldiers to go down, take him by force, and bring him into the barracks. That night, the Lord stood near him and said, Keep up your courage, for just as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must bear witness also in Rome. You have two powers at be here, which are both designed to do corruption. They are empire. They are power institutions. And so they eventually will be corrupt. And I think Paul goes through this, and Paul outsmarts it. The Rome, Roman 
Tribune goes, absolutely not. This is out of control. We got to take this guy. These Christian, these church people have no idea what they're doing. And they've continued to do that because we continue to do infighting. We continue to just exert power in ways. We continue to screw it up. And yet we are supposed to be the place where we are putting our citizenship. Our citizenship is not supposed to be in our country. Our citizenship is supposed to be in our spiritual community, within the church. The ways in which we imitate Christ. And yet we fail time and time and time again. And so while I was church, the question that I have for you today is a very simple one. How do we live our lives both in Wellhouse Church and outside of Wellhouse Church where our citizenship is not in being an American, but our citizenship is in being a person who reflects the way and imitates Christ and the way in which he entered and brought about experiences of life and liberation into this world? How can we live as a people who we have a healthy citizenship imitating the person of Christ?